All right. Um, human resource management in the in the global context, the international context. So um, this is, of course, about the human capital. Um, that's a terminology that we use a lot recently. Uh, human capital, um, as no, as a, a more advanced definition of human resource or human resources. Um, so we call it human capital because we, I think, we feel that human is one of the most important capital components in 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 our business, right? because it's human that runs the organization that um, sells the products, manages, you know, um, the processes, the supply chain, and also cooperation, even the finances and so on. So we, we name it human capital. Of course, the, the, the classical name is that human resource or human resource management. So you see that human resource management this is about the uh, activities to, to use human capital or human resources effectively. And see the activities that we are going to discuss in, uh, in details today, uh, the human resource strategy, the staffing, then the uh, performance evaluation, development, compensation, labor relations, and some other, some other issues related to human resource management. So uh, the, the and so we the company we always want to fit right, between the human resource practices and the corporate strategy that that we want and that we design and and uh, implement right to our business. So it should be should be a fit. Um, a fit means a fit in skills, personality, and also the uh, the strength, um, cultural fitness and, and other other types of you know, fit or fitness. Um, so what is this, the strategic role of human resource management? I think it's the same, right? The international context, just similar to the domestic context. Right, we have the, um, what's that? The, the, the major goal of corporation, right, which is to maximize the value of the firm, right, to maximize the value of the firm, um, the failure maximization purpose needs human capital by like human resource or excellent human resource management. So we need to um, serve customers and then manage the supply chain, um, manage the no the financial management and all other the managerial functions and they 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 take human at least until today. I mean in the future we might get a lot of help from artificial intelligence, other you no know, virtual um yeah virtual you know uh, brain or something but uh as of today we need we need human right to uh to make the the planning and then conduct the implementation and you no know, evaluation and so on so it's um more might be more complex in international business because of differences here see the differences in uh, everything right in the labor markets in the culture legal system economic system uh, political system and, and so on. So we have many differences. And the, uh, the key issue here about the, the global human resource management, I think is to sending, to, to send out you know, uh, international managers that we call it expatriates. So when we send out expatriates, uh, essentially this is someone that uh, is a citizen of one country uh, who goes somewhere right, to, to work abroad, right, to work, in uh, another country. So the question, no, the typical questions here, who should be sent? How should, should, uh, how should they be compensated? How should they be trained? And how should they be reoriented when they return home? So those typical questions that would determine whether the expatriates um, yeah, would be successful or maybe less successful or even having like, like um, unpleasant time abroad and something. So let's start from, uh, I think the next, uh, the, the first question, the staffing policy. Uh, the staffing policy, who should you send abroad? So staffing policy here, uh, can we, this is related to the selection of employees uh, to, to perform like a particular job. 
So you have like uh, similar to the domestic situation where you you uh, post people in a certain position with certain required skills, um, all kinds of skills, like technical skills, conceptual skills, um, communication skills, negotiation skills, and so on. So we have a set of skills required to perform a, a certain certain task or job, and we call it a staffing policy. And um, yeah, also what kind of norms and value system that that you have, right, would be very important, um, and would affect the staffing policy a lot. So uh, again, the strong corporate culture, then this will help help the firm implement the strategy because you no, know, once you have like a uh, culture in place and you have the uh, inter intertwined staffing policy, you have the right people, the uh, people who fit who are fit to to the, the their positions, then uh, they will of course help the company implement its, its strategy. So we have um, several approaches to the staffing policy that you could see here. Uh, three major approaches. The first one is ethnocentric. So ethnocentric, um, essentially, we believe that we uh, we had better fill out uh, positions abroad with the parent company nationals right, from our own from uh, our own country. So if you go somewhere, if you believe that you you are a Korean company, but you you're going to United States or Vietnam or anywhere, you send. The, the expatriates from your own country. So we call ethnocentric. So of course we have um, some advantages, some disadvantages as to the as to every approach, but uh, let's look at the second one. Polycentric means we try to um, you know, we try to appoint the host national, host country nationals uh, to manage you no know, to manage the divisions or subsidiaries in that country. So, so if you again, if you are a, a Chinese company, if you go to anywhere, you go to Thailand. When you are in Thailand, you try to appoint uh, many Thai nationals to manage your subsidiary there. So we call it polycentric. And the third one is uh, like less. Uh, you care less about you now the nationality. So you just you just try to find that the the most qualified people to uh, fill up the jobs. I just just to find the best people, regardless of nationalities. Uh, you don't they don't care where they come from, um, as long as they could they could work. You now uh, at I think at the uh, at the highest level, or the best people that you could find for a certain position, or certain jobs, and you would just you know uh, just hire and recruit from from there. So ethnocentric, polycentric, and geocentric, and to see the advantages and disadvantages of each. So if we start with the first one, the ethnocentric. Ethnocentric, um, essentially we pursue the ethnocentric. Uh, probably you, you are seeing um, a lack of, you know, qualified individuals in the host country. So again, if you go to that host country, you don't feel that uh, the host country nationals have the um, you know, required skills, or maybe not not at that level, um, and maybe they're still lagging behind in the like, advanced techniques or technologies or something. So it's better for you to send, you know, um, expatriates from your own country. And um, another advantage would be, you know, it's, it's very easy to to maintain the corporate culture because you're sending people from from the headquarters uh, from your own country uh, with similar similar culture and. Maybe the person has been with the company for a while, so you don't need to train or to or to to adjust the person culturally. And uh, also, I think we get a, a benefit of uh, failure creation. You could transfer the core competencies from from the headquarters, from your home country, to let's say a foreign operation to your subsidiary there. So is the the what's that the knowledge transfer? The core competency transfer would be, I think, would be um, uh, would be easier and and also more realistic, especially if if your company, the headquarters of the company, has the the skills, whereas the subsidiary in the host country is still in the stage of learning. Right. 
and also it's suitable with the international strategy. Remember, international strategy that we saw in the um, the, the the choices of strategy, international strategy. Essentially, you don't we don't care too much about local responsiveness, and also the uh, cost. I think the cost reduction cost reduction pressure is not that high either. So, yeah, you you, you have the flexibility because you you, you don't. You don't pay attention too much about local responsiveness right, in this kind of like, international strategy. Uh, we have these advantages here. Uh, it might limit the advancement opportunities for host country nationals, maybe uh, in the beginning because you are sending people from your home country. So, so the host country nationals they don't um, they don't get the opportunity to assume uh, a stronger role, you know, a high level, higher level position. Uh, even even in the subsidiary in in that cost country, and also uh, this might lead to cultural myopia. I think this is quite uh, should be should be avoided, should be prevented because uh, cultural myopia means you have the feeling that okay, uh, because the company or the company comes from from a certain country, and if you are there in the host country, they will feel that uh, if you are not. If you are not of a certain national, you don't have the chance to advance in your career and and so on. So it doesn't it doesn't create a, a proper environment for you know uh, boosting up motivation of your employees and uh, you know the, the the self esteem self um, actualization might not be there. So motivation the motivation level might be might be quite limited right, in this kind of uh, situation. What about polycentric? Polycentric, once again, we, you, you trust uh, the host country nationals to lead the subsidiary there. So what, what are the advantages? Uh, this is suitable for localization strategy or local responsiveness. So if you, um, if you prioritize or emphasize the local responsiveness, I think polycentric approach might be more proper because now you have, uh, you, recruit and you train the, the local executives there, the, the host national, host country nationals to lead the subsidiary. And this, on the other hand, this one, um, the opposite of the previous, the, what is it, the ethnocentric policy. Now for the polycentric approach or policy, we could minimize the myopia, right, cultural myopia. And also this could be less expensive to implement because you just recruit there. Okay, imagine that you don't need to send uh, people from your country, so you recruit there to to be executive in that subsidiary. So you could save the um, like incentives, like the overseas incentives or accommodation, children education, and so on of of the but the home home country nationals that you have to stand out. But you just simply recruit there, so you save a lot of money also. Um, the disadvantages here, you see that host country nationals have limited opportunities to gain experience. So here's the logic, right? If you, if you have the policy that uh, in that particular subsidiary, um, it will be led by, by the host country nationals, meaning that if you go to another country, then the same thing applies, right? Because the, the local, local executive will lead that particular subsidiary. So they uh, somehow they have limited opportunities to to go to like another subsidiary because you have this kind of policy, the polycentric policy. Uh, subsidiary, one particular subsidiary would be led by the local executive there. So uh, it's less likely that you send uh, an executive from one, one host country to another host country. Right? So they have limited opportunities to gain more experience outside their, their own country in that subsidiary. And also, uh, this could create a gap between the uh, host country managers and parent country managers because we don't we don't have uh, many overlapping uh, overlapping staffing. There's like a subsidiary is like a company of its own led by the local executive. So we don't uh, yeah we we interact maybe by by video conferencing by um, you know occasional meetings and so on. But the the level of interaction might be might be less, less, um, less intensive and less intimate right, between the host country executive and, and also the, the headquarters. 
So what about the, the third one, right? The geocentric. So geocentric means again, we, we don't you don't really care about the uh, nationality. You just find the best the best person to um, to fill a certain position. So uh, what are the, the uh, what are advantages here? We could build a strong unifying culture, an informal man management network. So um, the culture could be could be globalized or could be unified because you send people anywhere. Or you could send uh, people from, from, from the headquarters to any, any subsidiaries. And the same thing, you could recruit um, a person from, uh, from a certain country, uh, from a certain subsidiary and uh, send him or her to another subsidiary. So you just send anyone uh, to the best or to the fittest place uh, to that that person that you you deem proper um this is highly you know beneficial and suitable for companies pursuing the global and transnational strategy remember transnational means you um you emphasize local responsiveness and the cost reduction pressure is also high so we have the transnational and uh, transnational uh, strategy um, so, um, this also enables a company to use like the best, the best available human resources, or human capital that we have from wherever. So, if you find somebody, you are, um, if you are a, a, a French company, and it happens that you have a subsidiary in Canada, and you have um, that world class, what is that, executives or human resources from Canada, you can you can harness the human capital and maybe you send it back to the headquarters or you, you send them to other countries. So you, be, you get the best, right, the best uh, people, right? Um, so the right people at right places. Right? That's I think the principle that we want to use and we believe to be, uh, to be pragmatic and accurate with the geocentric staff, staffing policy. And of course you build you could build a cadre of international executives um, and they, they could feel at home wherever they work within your company because you have, you have this kind of geocentric and global staffing policy. So if, if they're located, if they're positioned in the United States and the next three years they're posted in, I don't know, in, um, in Korea and get yeah, the next two years they're uh, posted in Sweden and some other countries, they feel at home because the company, the corporate culture is, is the same everywhere and we are using the global geocentric staffing policy. This advantages here is probably limited by immigration laws because some, I think some countries require uh, certain positions to be, to be filled by a uh, local executive. I think in many countries, the uh, like chief human resource management, in many countries, again, uh, chief human resource management must be must be filled by um, a local executive. So um, yeah, depending on the country, but many many countries are having some uh, policies regarding certain positions, and also it's costly to implement because you have to send out people, and of course you have to you know, pay for uh, like additional in incentives, like children education, some other you know, trainings, adjustment uh, costs, and and some other things. Okay, this is a summary of everything that we have seen, actually. So the next one is um, failure. Right? Failure is quite common for this kind of expatriate, expatriate life. Uh, whatever policy you choose, that ethnocentric, geocentric, or polycentric, um, uh, failure could be costly. You see the, the statistics there. It's quite interesting, right? Uh, 16 to 40% of American expatriates in developed countries fail. Even, even when they they go to developed countries, still between 16 and 40% of expatriates do, uh, did not do it successfully. And uh, this is even more, I think, more concerning. This one, like almost 70% of, of the expatriates fail when they were assigned to developing countries. Because life is, is um, I think, more, life is tougher in developing countries. 
uh, with respect to facilities and um, you know, some other things like the, the health, uh, safety, and, and so on. So the, the rate of failure is even higher when uh, expatriates are assigned to developing countries. And the cost could be, could be quite high, like between 40,000 and a million, according to the statistics. So see the uh, more interesting again, data here, statistics. See the uh, US multinationals. So uh, percentage of companies you see here, like 7%, 7 of, of companies. Uh, so like 20 to 40% is at the um, recall rate. Right? And yeah, 24% have like less than 10% recall rate for US multinationals. Um, what about the, let's say the Japanese multinationals here, the Japanese multinational, like um, uh, Sony and, and some other companies, right? the famous Japanese companies, um, see 76% saw a recall rate of less than five, but about, about 14%, at 14%, um, you see a recall rate uh, between 11 to 19%. So it's quite, yeah, quite moderate, but still like quite, uh, quite substantial. If you think about the, you know, the fourteen percent of companies have the recall rate of let's say eleven to to nineteen percent, and also European multinationals, where we saw a lower, lower um, percentage of companies that that recall their executives, right, it's between eleven to fifteen percent. Uh, being recalled and the percentage of company three percent. So um, we have, of course, many many reasons that we are going to see. But uh, uh, I think the, especially in the past, uh, the, the the culture was more um, culture were more segregated in the past. So if you're in the um, the North America, in maybe to be more specific, in one particular country, the culture was so different, was vastly different from. Uh, maybe your 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 country, right? the uh, home country, and not many people could cope, cope with the differences. You know, the adjustments required for for himself or herself, for his or her families, family members, and and so on. So let's look at the uh, the reasons why the you know expatriate, the sending of expatriate failed. Um, inability to adapt. This is in particular for U.S. expatriate. Yes, expatriates here. Inability of spouse to adapt. Um, managers and inability to adjust. And the classical reason here. Family related reasons. Maybe they 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 were apart uh, and distance was is a, a big distance. And although they had. Um, Nowadays we have like Zoom and other like Google Google Meet and so on. Uh, the video conferencing you no know, applications, but still uh, without without the, I think some people couldn't live without uh, personal touches. So it's quite a difficult situation. I like guess understandable. And then the next one: personal and emotional maturity, and inability to cope with larger of overseas responsibilities. So I think the last two are very, very um, influential. I mean, of course we agree that family family matters are important, but right? if the spouse and, and children couldn't ad adapt, then everybody's unhappy at home and you couldn't concentrate on your work. So it's definitely your assignment would be, um, yeah, would be doomed to fail because you, know, you, you couldn't concentrate on, on the job and you have, you are distracted by, by family matters, you know, the spouse, uh, unhappiness or children problem and so on. Uh, but the, you see the fourth and the fifth one, I think this is very important, uh, emotional maturity. So uh, if you're a, a company that don't, don't give proper uh, orientation before the person goes to another country, this, this might happen most of the time because uh, so the person has to you know, deal with new things by himself or herself and yeah, many um, yeah, different practices. Remember our, our cultural differences that we talked about like several weeks ago. 
the high context culture, low context culture, the monoconic and polyconic culture. So things are, uh, might be very different but right, in, uh, in the host country. So you get the culture shock, you, have, you feel unhappy, you feel betrayed. Uh, for example, you are an, uh, an outspoken person and you are assigned to a country where so the culture is like high context, they are more subtle, they are more silent. Uh, they, don't, they don't tell you outrightly about their feeling and so on, and you misinterpret many things and you start feeling that you are betrayed, you, um, you know, they don't like you, they step you from behind and any sort of feeling. But of course, the other hand is, is, is also true. If you are from, from a high context culture and they send you to a low context culture, uh, people are more outspoken in the host country and they 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 complain to your nose about what you don't do well and you feel discouraged you feel that they don't like you they hate you uh they're they they are you no know, they don't like your your race your ethnic and so on those you could you could feel that way because of maybe the the people there your uh partners in the host country are more outspoken so they tell you that so you do it do this wrong and it's not it's not proper the level of quality is low and so on so you feel again you feel um, angry you feel that they don't like you and so on so this kind of emotional maturity is, is really really crucial uh, apart from again the family family matters that uh they are likely to happen of course but uh the fourth and the fifth points are really right um really related to the the quality as as an expatriate that has to go to another country. So what about European? Uh, mostly about uh, spouse adjustment. Right? Many, fa I know, uh, much failure is, is um, yeah, was engendered by the spouse adjustment. And Japanese expatriate here, inability to cope with larger offices responsibility. You can see Japanese more, um, uh, High context culture, more silent, more subtle. But if you send a Japanese expatriate to to a similar environment, I think they don't have much problem. They don't have many problems to or uh, to adjust. Right? If you send them to maybe Southeast Asia, send them to Korea or to China, those are more or less similar. Of course, not exactly the same, but at least you have many similarities in terms of the the the, the culture, the work culture, and also the communication habit and so on. Uh, but if you send you know, the, the Japanese or Korean expatriates to let's say to uh, the United States or Australia and other countries, uh, it might take you know, longer to adjust. So it's very important to give a pre-departure orientation to, to your expatriates because the cultures, cultures are, are, are relatively different. Um, difficulties to, with the new environment, see the second here. And then personal or emotional problems again, as you can imagine, if uh, the host country is very outspoken and you come from a more subtle, you know, more, uh, yeah, more high context culture, actually it will be quite a culture shock to get a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, this kind of communication, more, more open, more outright. Okay? Of course, at, at some extent, um, uh, people will be happy because oh, this is the first time they have this kind of like open conversations. They could they could um, converse with uh, a lot of openness. They could express their ideas and so on. But uh, again, if you come from a more subtle culture, definitely you don't expect the uh, uh, beyond a certain limit openness, right? Because you, know, you might you might get discouraged and. Some other emotional problems if you are not prepared, but of course, uh, with with the, uh, the the passing of time, with proper training and more experiences, people could 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 adjust and cope with this kind of uh, situation. Uh, lack of technical competence, uh, maybe you no know, technical skills. Um, no, the required skills are not not possessed by the executive, and of course. The same, like the classical reason here, spouse adjustment, uh, including children. So how can we reduce the expatriate failure? Um, many things we can do here, self-orientation, uh, pre-departure orientation to, you know, to improve the self-confidence, 
self-esteem and also mental well-being. Remember, uh, mental well-being is very important. Uh, you, yeah, but to to some extent, you have to like uh, I don't know, thicken your skin and so on right? to to be more to be tougher right? in terms of uh, your mental state. Um, interaction. So interaction, the interaction skill, how to interact with people, how to adjust your, your uh, I don't know, the communication skills in other countries. So if you're a silent person at, at, at home, you, you seldom talk, um, you just, you know, how to say, like you um, put your head down, you know, keep your mouth shut, you just work and you perform very well at home and you, you are really like top achiever, but you don't talk much. But imagine that if you are sent, you are sent to a uh, uh, very open country, Australia, the United States, or uh, Western European countries in general, then you have to interact more, right? Communication skill has, has to improve. Um, yeah, but just because so you need the, what's that, the, uh, the nature of performance might be different right, between your home country and your host country. So communication may be part of part of the uh, a, part of the success factor in a particular country. So we might have to improve this one as well. Also perception, uh, perceptual ability to understand um, how people behave and why be, they behave that way in terms of you know the uh, openness of communication and also the uh, I don't know the um, also, written communication, not only oral, but also written communication, how they write. Um, in, of course, in certain countries, people write more concisely. In other countries, they write in a, in a, a long, long style of fashion, right? especially in, I don't know, in, uh, maybe in Asian countries, pe people write longer, especially uh, to ask for many things before, before you really deal with uh, no, the, the, the real intention of your letter or your email or something. But in other countries, no, they, they, they do it concisely, you know, it's straight to the point and so on. Um, also other, other things, the, uh, yeah, those kind of, you know, uh, communication in a meeting maybe, like the, the way of communication, like in, in certain countries, you're quite reluctant to, to attack someone else in the meeting uh, attack in the sense that you you disagree. Right? We, you disagree with someone's opinion, and you're quite reluctant to to um, to really you know challenge that different opinion in a in a in a you know, open or upright fashion. Right? So you do it more, you know, uh, more indirectly. But in certain countries, you no, know, in other countries, culture might be different. And if you say something that they don't they don't agree with, they will. They will challenge you to your nose, and yeah, have to try to you know, understand um, why people do that and why. I mean, how people do it and why they do it, and so on. Like right? perceptual ability. So after some time, I think we can adjust. Definitely, right? but it, it takes time to learn. Uh, cultural toughness again. This is, I think, the key ability to adjust. You find difficulties. Uh, you don't give up. Right? Different cultures, different, different everything. Um, the key here is it's better to have toughness right, for, uh, for the expectors that you want to send out. So with the toughness, the person doesn't give up. Right? You don't sit up on uh, any kind of difficulties, but you, you keep improving. So what is required here is a global mindset, right? essentially global mindset here, cognitive complexity that uh, the person could deal with complexity and ambiguity, some uh, perplexing situations, something that we, we didn't think about in, in our home countries. Uh, when we are in a host country, suddenly it happens. So this, this is like cognitive complexity. So the, uh, the speed at which you could, you could deal with this kind of like complexity, confusion, ambiguity, and so on. And the second, I think second, subset of the mindset is cosmopolitan outlook, like open to the world. Uh, you know that the world is so, so uh, 
so broad and, and vast and um, wherever you go, you would expect that things are different, uh, different, different language, different culture, different person, different uh, you know, uh, behavior and so on. So with this kind of cosmopolitan outlook, um, you are more prepared and your expectation is, I think, uh, yeah, it's quite relevant uh, to, to the global you know, um, human resource context. So global mindset is often acquired, see, early in life, not necessarily too, but you could help a lot, right? If you come from a, bi, a bicultural family, from a bicultural family, maybe your, your father is of a certain nationality or descent, your mother from another, right? like a, a bicultural or multicultural family, this will help a lot. Right? Uh, because you are, you you are trained from the beginning or from uh, since you were since you were a child um, in um, this kind of multi uh, was a melting pot or multi cultural family, and uh, you will gain um, a lot of experiences uh, if you have lived in many foreign countries, right? Your maybe college years, then a graduate program, and then the working years, and so on. So the more you live in other countries, uh, the more able you adjust to a new environment because you have been there, right? you have been in many, many places with differences. And uh, you get, get a lot of help if you have learned like foreign languages uh, since you were a child because with, uh, with different languages also came the, you know, the cultural parts. So you learn the foreign languages, um, the, the see, like if you, if you learn, um, I don't know, yeah, you, Europe, a European language like English or uh, German, somehow you, you you can you get the the cultural part also, like the the grammar, the vocabularies, the 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 diction, the style of speaking, and so on. So it it helps a lot. Right? It helps a lot. What about training and develop uh, training and management development? Like training and development. I think this. These are um, uh, crucial parts of you not know, preparing, preparing the expatriate to go abroad. So what is the difference here, training and development? So essentially training is more like short term. So this is more short term and development is more long term. The longer term type of, um, you know, Skill, skill enhancement process, right? Training is short term, more short, like cultural training is quick, like cultural training, uh, pre-departure, language, okay? Um, of course, if you go to a specific host country, it's better if the executive or the expatriate is trained on um, the major language to be used in that host country. And also practical training, uh, practical training about day day to day day to day life, uh, with with the uh, with, with his or her family also. Uh, so we have all kind of training. So short term in nature. Uh, you see the statistics. Uh, quite interesting that only about thirty percent, only thirty percent of expatriates sent to other countries receive training before departure. Well, this is quite surprising and, and actually quite risky. That's why there has been a lot of uh, expatriate failure in the past. So what happens when um, again, expatriates re return home? Um, there's the like reorientation, uh, reorientation, reintegrating expatriates back into, into uh, the work life in the home country and how to you know really harness and apply the knowledge that they, they will have gained in the host country when they go back to the headquarters. Okay, so this is like re-entry, reorientation into the home country. And this, is, uh, this also could, could prevent uh, further you no know, culture shock because they, they're, they're, they're heading home, right? they're going back to the home country, preparing the expatriate and his or her family also like going back to the home country, uh, to the kids' education, 
the spouse life and also to the to the uh yeah to the, the home home country and the, the corporate culture at headquarters. So we're about, about development. So we just saw the training again. Once again, training is more short term in nature, and development is long term in nature. So management development is like enhancement of skills uh, for for long term benefits, like ongoing management education. Maybe you send you send your expatriates to I don't know like um, executive development program at at Harvard or um, Quarton School. And some other schools, you know, like they have management education. Nowadays, they have a lot of that online programs, so they can do it anywhere. But if you go to, or if you go to uh, another country, like from the United States, you're going to Japan. It's good to have also management education in in Japan with Tokyo University and so on. So uh, they could they could develop as as a person, as an executive, both. Um, in terms of you know the uh, cultural and uh, you know those kind of like short term oriented skill enhancement that we call training and also development like management uh, what's that the, the the management skills the the prowess right the the ability to to lead and and so on so once again uh, development is more long term and we could we can do it this way as well by rotation. So you have, for example, you set a policy that every three years an expatriate and executive executive will be reassigned to another subsidiary in another country. So that that will give the expatriates more opportunities to again to uh, develop in terms of the you know, technical skills, uh, conceptual skills, human skills as well, with more experiences. So if you have this kind of management development program, uh, uh, this is highly supportive of the transnational and global strategy. At transnational, once again, the local, high local responsiveness and high global integration as well. How should expectations be evaluated? So who should evaluate? I think uh, both the host nation management, a host nation executive, and also the Headquarters executive should evaluate the performance of an expatriate. An expatriate. Um, uh, however, we have we might have like unintentional bias here. Uh, the for example, the home country, home country executive, when they evaluate, they rely on that data, right? numbers, data because they they are not there. Right? They are not in the host country, so they're evaluating from from their desk. Uh, at headquarters in the home country, so they rely on, you know, this kind of numbers, hard data, statistics, and so on. On the other hand, um, host country executive, when they evaluate uh, an expatriate, there they could be biased toward the frame of reference, like uh, maybe more about the uh, interaction and then the uh, personal closeness during their working together there and so on. So uh, again bias or biases will always be there just need to find a better you know um more what's that more accurate you know evaluation measures right, i think so um how could we reduce the bias to reduce the bias here uh of course more weight should be given to the on-site on-site appraisal so if the person is there I think the evaluation on site would be more meaningful than the what's that the uh, desk evaluation from the headquarters or from somewhere else. So on site means you you can see the person, uh, you know, like in person, working in person there, like on site, you know, they're working at, at, at on the spot and so on. And of course, a former expatriate who has served in the same location could be involved, right? Too because. That person has been there, uh, has been, he or she has worked in that particular location. And again, he or she knows the, the difficulties, um, the, the, the strength and weaknesses of, of that subsidiary and, and so on. And uh, of course, the headquarters executive 
can be consulted uh, before the on-site manager completes the whatever termination or, or exit evaluation and so on. So key issues in compensation. So we're not we're talking about compensation now. How to adjust compensation? If you send, uh, especially if you send a person to another country with a higher, a higher living cost. Um, yeah, so we have to have to incentivize the expected more. So the question is, should should the company pay according to uh, each country's standard, or should it just you know standardize the payment on a global basis? Right. This is a very important question. If you look at the maybe statistics here on average, uh, U.S. executives are making a lot of money, but this is like. 2005, 2006, things have changed a lot, right? Nowadays, after the 2008 crisis and then uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and so on, things have, have, of course, have been shaken, have changed a lot. But uh, assuming that we have certain numbers like this, if you send an executive from the United States to another country, um, definitely we couldn't lower, no, couldn't lower the, 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 what's that, the, the pay that the person has, has been receiving at home because that will, dismotivate the person and most likely he or she will not accept the, the assignment. Right? Maybe the person will quit. But so at least uh, it should be the same as, as the, the amount that he or she has received, uh, has been receiving at home. But on the top of that, we might have to add some like uh, assignment incentives because the person and his or her family have to go to another country, you have to do a lot of adjustments, um, the kids' education, uh, spouse activities, and so on. So we still have to add incentive on the top of that. So what about the the other way around? Right? If you if you come from a country where actually your uh, your your pay, a salary and salary and bonus and some other you know uh, incentives that that you receive at home. Um, is probably not not high enough to survive in in the country of assignment in the host country. Then definitely the company has to has to compensate the person according to the host country standard, right? I think that's quite quite understandable. So um, okay, they have to raise the pay to to the level of the host country if that's the case, because you come from a country where your um, your total pay, right, your compensation package at home is maybe not enough right, to, to match with the living standard in the host country. So definitely the company has to compensate more to at least uh, to be at par, right, to match with the host country situation. So how should, again, expectors be paid? Um, so most firms use the balance sheet approach that right, equalizes uh, it, it equalizes purchasing power across countries. So if you go again, uh, go to a country with a higher, uh, more expensive place, you send someone to Switzerland, which is very expensive, then definitely you have to have to pay the person like accordingly, right? Because now if you if you, if you don't do that, nobody wants to accept the assignment definitely, right? Because it's more expensive, and you know have to actually in terms of purchasing power, you know, the, the, the compensation might be decreasing in the, in the real sense, right, in the purchasing power sense. So you have to cover, have to pay the differences, or even on the top of that, the company still has to uh, provide, um, what's that, the relocation incentives, you know, some adjustment incentives and so on. So compensation package, uh, with five components here, best salary, best salary. Um, again, you know, this is different every in every place, different system. But we have best salary. We have we have bonus or bonuses, and we have the foreign service premium, the extra pay because you work outside your country. You are uh, separated from. You have to be separated from your maybe family members, the relative, and so on. The foreign service premium and allowances like hardship allowance, housing, cost of living, children education, and so on. You have uh, the fourth component of tax differentials, because if you go to another country 
you have to pay taxes in the host country, but still you have to pay uh, taxes in your home country. So this kind of tax differentials may have to be covered by the company as, as additional incentive. And of course, the benefits here, benefits like health, the medical, as this is, I think, uh, uh, is of a big concern to many people because if you go to another country with the lower, lower level of healthcare providers and so on, you might be very concerned about yourself and also your uh, family members. So you ask for you know, the uh, whatever riders, maybe like insurance and then riders, uh, pension benefits, retirement planning, and so on. Then the, uh, about, the, the, about the labor relations, uh, this is also complicated because every country has different, different level of, of um, like influence of labor union. Uh, so essentially, labor unions can limit a firm's ability to pursue global strategy. So definitely uh, the, the global human resource management, we need to um, improve the relationship, like the, um, the conflict management, the harmony with, with the labor union in, in a host country. So what are, what is um, like labor union concern about usually? You can see here, um, uh, the labor union is, is, is concerned that multinationals could threaten right, to move production to another country. So they're they afraid that their members would lose jobs. If the multinationals have a lot of like, have a stronger cloud and they decide to move to another country, then the members might lose jobs. And many of them accuse multinationals to only you know, send like, low-skilled jobs to foreign plants or factories. So if situations change, they just quit because the low-skilled low jobs, they could do it anywhere you just need to close down this one, shut this one down and move to just another, another country another host country and also um, they're concerned right? many of the labor unions are concerned that multinationals will will enforce the like, employment practices and this kind of um, employee agreements using using the systems from their home countries so things might be different like um, like how many days you know, people could get like uh, paid leaves, uh, sick leaves and so on, right? It's because things might be different, but multinational corporations might have, might have their own systems imported from their home countries. And um, especially the labor unions that have, have enjoyed like very easy, you know, very easy, relatively easy life. If your country is having, I don't know, uh, 35 hours of work, um, what else? Like 21 days of paid leaves every day that could be accumulated and so on. And then comes a, a maybe a multinational from a certain country that only, only usually offers like um, 14 days of sick leaves per, per year and it couldn't be accumulated. And maybe that multinational is requiring people to work like 40 hours a week. So this might be not normal in your country, but in that country, it's just common like 40 hours. And even in, in other countries, uh, uh, I don't know, like maybe in your country, you know, the, uh, the terminology of 996, uh, 996 means you go to work at nine, you finish at nine and you work six days a week. So if you, if you have that kind of multinational, then the labor union in the host country will be quite, quite, quite concerned about because Usually, the members, that the union members, have been have been enjoying like easier life uh, so far until the multinational corporation comes. Okay, so um, how do they respond, right? Uh, the labor unions, how do they respond to multinational power, multinational corporation power? So they try to set up international organizations as well, uh, international labor union and uh, something like that. They lobby everywhere, lobby their uh, national leaders, you know, the 
I don't know, the president, the prime minister, house of representatives, the senates, and so on. And again, they, they try to push for a multinational re regulation to the United Nations and some international labor organi organizations and so on. However, so far, the effort um, has been quite limited right? because success is, is limited yeah, because every country has its own characteristics, uh, how they uh, deal with like labor union, um, employment and employee law and so on. Um, uh, what about the, the response by multinational corporations? Here, uh, firms could centralize labor relations uh, at the headquarters. So every subsidiary doesn't need to deal with the labor union or labor relation by, by itself. So the firm, let's say a, a firm is central, centralizing its labor relations, labor union relations at the headquarters. So the negotiation could be, could be stronger and have more, again, more power rather than, rather than allowing every subsidiary in a host country to deal or to negotiate on its own with the labor union there. And um, again, uh, this could be a major source of competitive advantage. So it's very important to manage your relationship with the employees, with labor, because if the labor is happy, they work at, at uh, their utmost potentials, then you know, your products would be of high quality. You could maintain the quality of everything, the process, the products, the, uh, the environment and so on. I think it's still very important wherever we go, have to really manage the people well. If, if they have like a labor union, you have to try to uh, deal with the labor union in the, in the optimum, um, yeah, optimum level. Of course, we don't give in, give in everything, but uh, yes, kind of like take and give, of course, right? in any kind of relationship. So this kind of management, um, stronger negotiation skills, and then um, also listening to, to their concerns, and then um, better representative by the, the union people and so on would be, would be very crucial and beneficial to the firm as well. All right, I think uh, that's all the like, key topics about global, global human resource management. Again, this is one of the most important capital components of, to the firm as of today, when we still need human to manage everything, um, to think about, you know, to, to plan, to design, you know, all kind of systems, and of course, to implement and evaluate the effectiveness of every system. Um, thank you. I think that's all for, for now and see you next time.